right, welcome, welcome everyone. Happy Taco Tuesday Eve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let me just adjust some settings here. Okay, great. All right, if everyone can tell me in the chat, can you hear me? Just wanna make sure if everyone um, has their speakers on. Um, if you could type one, yep. a number one yep, man, in the yeah. chat. Manuel says yes. And then, well, everybody, and then he says one, Calvin one, David one, everybody Perfect. one. Perfect, okay. All right. Great, great, great. Awesome. All right, all right. So. Guys, welcome. Welcome to Mindshare Monday. Um, this is the 10th Mindshare Monday. So that means we've been doing this for 10 weeks. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel like it at all. Yeah, it doesn't. It, yeah. it really flew by. Yeah. I'm um, still nervous now as if it was my first episode. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, except now we have, well, I have allergies. So it's very different. Okay, um, I'll do most of the talking today as usual. <laughs> yeah. Okay, appreciate it um all right so today we have a very special episode um today we have the sense the u.s census bureau mm -hmm. um i want you guys to ask any other organization that could get the census bureau on a webinar <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we pulled some major strings that's for a lot of favors uh, we're, we're in a lot of debt <laughs> Make it too. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're applying for the PPP loan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. But yes, today we have Andrew Haight. Um, that's how you pronounce your last name? Yeah, yeah. Okay. got Perfect. it right. Um, so let's get right into it. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, uh, Ryan and I, uh, we're yep. from the NJSBDC at NJCU. Um, we're basically a nationwide uh, program that provides low, no cost business counseling and training for entrepreneurs, small businesses. Um, but the real star of the show today is Andrew here. Um, if you could please give a, a short introduction as to who you are, who you work for. Sure. So my name is Andy Haight. Um, you don't need to call me Andrew. I, I get called Andrew by my mom or by my <laughs> wife when I'm in like deep doo-doo. Um, so I'm an economist at the Census Bureau who work at our headquarters office, or at least I think I work in our headquarters office in Maryland. Um, been with the Bureau for a little over 30 years, hard to believe um, that I've been there that long. Um, and I have spent my entire career working in what we call the economic directory which is the part of census that does our business surveys. Awesome. Awesome. So um, you're basically in charge of, of all the data that has to do with small business. So I don't know if I would quite go as far as to say I'm in charge of it, uh, okay. but the data tool we're actually going to be looking at today, uh, I am the project lead on and the chief designer of census mm -hmm. business builder. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool stuff. Okay. And if anybody here has been to any of the workshops that we've done, uh, we've been advocating uh, the CBB as an essential resource tool for people to design for the past years. You know, it's always at the last, uh, one of the last slides that we have of almost every presentation, regardless of the topic, you know, of uh, use the tools and the resources around you. And CBB is one of those tools that it's free and it's immensely valuable. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super excited about having Andrew today. I'm sorry, Andy, right? That's Andy. right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I pay attention sometimes. There you go. So, all right. Yeah, and, and guys, from a marketing perspective, um, I mean, I know a lot of small businesses don't think of data as being uh, um, something to look into, but if you look at these big corporations, things uh -huh. like Google, Apple, Facebook, that's that's the core of their business uh, yep. for a reason. Um, data, as far as a marketer, it's it's the one thing that I need to know uh, so I can market to my customer, so I can mm -hmm. make sales, so I can in increase revenue, right? So mm -hmm. this this stuff is, um, I think, is super important for a business. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. So let's get into the headlines today. Okay. Um, there's exciting stuff that's happening with PPP loans mm -hmm. um, this week. There's also grant programs coming out tomorrow. So um, let's open up this first one here. Okay. 
So as many of you guys know, on Friday, the president signed the Flexibility Act for the PPP. So now it's called the PPPFA. Uh, and what's happening now is uh, similar to what we spoke about last week, which were the updates, uh, which we, you know, we'll go over them again uh, in, a, in a minute now. But now it's, become, it's, it's been signed and changes are going to be effective as of uh, February, I'm sorry, as of June 5th for anybody who secures a new uh, PPP loan. After June 5th, the rules are automatically uh, governed to what these new ones are. So let's go down, down the line. So the, uh, we spoke before that there was a proposal to extend the forgiveness uh, uh, time from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Uh, that's one of the first ones here. So it's, a, it's very important to note because a lot of businesses are saying, hey, I don't have enough time because my business is still shut down or my business is just barely opening. You know, I'm not gonna have enough time to really take advantage of the uh, forgivable component. So people you know, uh, you know, heard, and one of the things I, oh, we always mention is talk to your local lawmakers. Uh, people heard, you know, and pass it right up the line, uh, right up the ladder to the ultimate, you know, signer. And it's now 24 weeks, which is great. You guys have a lot more time to make sure that you take advantage of the PP program and get as much forgiven as possible. Uh, the other one that was uh, a big, um, uh, I don't know, uh, question uh, or concern for a lot of small businesses is that you had to spend 75% of the proceeds directly on payroll. You know, but there's a lot of new expenses that, uh, that exist that didn't exist before. You know, maybe my business, now, I now have to invest in buying face masks for all my employees, you know, dividers, you know, uh, you know or just new software, new, te new technology. Um, so they're giving you the ability to say, well, as long as you spend now 60% directly on payroll, you know, there is a, uh, you know, we'll look at the entire amount to be forgiven within the, uh, well now 24 week period, as long as they still fall within the acceptable uh, buckets for forgiveness. Uh, let's see, what's the uh, next bullet point here we have here? Uh, oh, safe harbors is a huge one too. So for businesses that have been, uh, I don't know, uh, wearing shackles because of government mandates, you know, you're still not allowed to open up for X, Y, Z reasons, you know. Um, it's hard to say I received my PUP loan last week, but the government says I still can't operate at normal capacity because of, you know, uh, uh, mandates. Uh, there is now going to be a safe harbor uh, policy that will take that into consideration for the forgiveness components, you know, which to me is, uh, is, is essential, especially in, uh, you know, in economies that, uh, that really, you know, uh, I don't know, need that, that type of uh, time in order to generate the cash flow to keep the, uh, the business open. Um, huge one is that the PUP was always at a two-year loan. So after you receive the loan, you had uh, the amortization of the, you know, the payback period was always two years. Now it's extended to five years. Again, reducing that overhead uh, you know, mandatory uh, cash flow uh, that, goes, uh, that goes out uh, to a longer uh, uh, pay period, which lowers the amount that you have to pay on a monthly basis, which is always going to be advantageous to you guys. Uh, let's see what's the next one. Um, the deferral payments too. Uh, that also got extended for an additional uh, 10 months. Uh, so yeah, it starts usually the moment you uh, apply for forgiveness. Um, and if you don't apply for forgiveness, then it automatically defaults uh, to, I think it's, the, I think it's the, the forgiveness period, and then it automatically defaults from that point. Uh, and then the, thing, the big thing that I want a lot of people to, uh, to keep in mind is that June 30th still remains the last date which you can apply um, uh, for the PPP, or the last day you can still get a, a PPP loan approved which means that we have a couple of weeks. So I want everybody who has not applied to, you know, to quickly contact your local bank or your local participating uh, PUP you know, lender uh, and make sure they get that application in because you know, we only have a couple of weeks left. Right. But, yep. Awesome. All right, so let's get to this next one here. So this is directly from the nj.gov site. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, it's a little... Scroll down. Yep. So what this is referring to is how we're going to reopen. You know, um, you know Governor Murphy uh, mentioned a while back the different stages of how businesses are going to be reopened. Uh, but we wanted a clear guideline to show you guys you know, on this day, this type of business can be open. On that day, this type of business can be open. So you can see here, June 15th is when stage two uh, officially starts. And once June 15th, I mean, once stage two starts on June 15th, these are going to be the types of businesses that open on certain types of days, you know, hair salons, barbershops, you know, June 22nd, 
you know, outdoor yep. uh, dining on June 15th. You know, so uh, obviously, you know, given local guidelines, whatever the local guidelines are that we still have to you know, maintain uh, awareness of. And then other ones, I believe, I'm not sure if you guys can help me out with this, but I believe the, the bottom ones, you know, the uh, limited gym and fitness, since there's no data on it, I, my interpretation is that it's on a assessment basis. They'll be looking yep. at it and, you know, making judgments on the fly based on what's happening. Now, that, that's my best guess because there's no dates on the bottom part. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think the same. Uh, I think June 15 is going to hit. They're going to see how that goes. Um, and then they're going to probably put a date on that because uh, I think that that one's a little bit more tricky. Um, you know, b people are are, are yeah. a lot closer to each other there. Um, a lot more chance for for yeah, yeah, COVID yeah. to pass around, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm I'm super excited for outdoor dining. <laughs> <laughs> I have been dying to ask a waiter yeah. a question, something, right? <laughs> yeah. I couldn't wait for the hair salons to open up, obviously. You know, so that's why I looked at my picture. Two weeks ago, I got affected by the COVID haircut. Yeah. I haven't gone there yet. I haven't gone there yet. <laughs> I could wait. I could wait. June yeah. 22 is not too far. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Awesome. All right. Awesome. So what's the okay. uh, next slide? All right. Next one is. And as a reminder, all these links are available, uh, you know, um, after the, uh, after the program. So you guys can click on it and read it at your own leisure. Yep. Um, guys, make sure you, you look into your email. Um, and make sure you save our email as a contact so we don't go to spam. Uh, sometimes email servers just do that, uh, but it's sbdc at njcu.edu. Make sure you add that to your contact list uh, because I do send you free resources um, and the links to these videos uh, and also the recorded version of these videos in case you need to go back. Yeah, now, this is a huge one. You know, uh, everybody loves free money, right? You know, so uh, this is a, uh, uh, the grant that's been very popular from NJEDA, um, and it's going to be open again tomorrow morning. You know, so I want to make sure that everybody's uh, aware and ready for this. Uh, same thing that happened before, and if we're looking at history, it's, it's run out pretty quickly after the doors open up for, for the grant application to, uh, to be processed. So I want to make sure that everybody watching this, you know, is, uh, is on the computers if they haven't done so already in the past with the grant program. Uh, to make sure they participate, you know, and ten thousand dollars, you know, could mean a, uh, a a make or break scenario. Uh, what's going to be different this time is that applications are going to be available in Spanish. However, NJEDA did hire uh, translators to provide uh, services in a few of the languages. It says here in the second paragraph, um, contracted interpreters, uh, interpretation services to support speakers of ten additional languages. You know, so uh, I'm assuming everybody here understands English. You know, but uh, if you have friends or family that have a stronger command of, of let's say, Korean or Polish or, you know, Hindi, uh, please let them know that there are some resources from NJEDA uh, that can get, help guide them through the application so they can get the uh, $10,000 or up to $10,000, I should say, uh, grant from, uh, from the state. Yeah, and, and it's super crucial that you guys even have your application ready tonight. Um, because last time they released, I think it, what was it, in 30 minutes or an it hour? It was an hour, yep, it was right under an hour, the, fun, the funds were exhausted. The whole funds, and how much was that? It was like millions of dollars, <laughs> <laughs> just like that. So yep. um, th this is a little more, 45 million was more than before, I think, right? Yep. Um, but um, you still wanna be quick, and th there's a lot of people applying for this, uh, so you definitely wanna have a leg up, have your application ready tonight, so you could mm -hmm. submit it in the morning. Um, perfect, awesome. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So now for the exciting part. Yep. Andrew, I hope you're ready. <laughs> I am. We're awesome. The official golden microphone over. All right. So <laughs> this is how to use census tools for business. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so Andrew can go ahead and, and share his. So it looks like it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, so I just gave you a uh, sharing right, so you can go ahead. There we go. Awesome. Okay, 
So thank you so much, Christian um, and Ryan, for inviting me to come and speak with you all today. Um, before we got started, I was uh, sharing where I have been sheltering in place, um, <laughs> sitting here on your screen. Yeah. Um, this is going to be my future home, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we will uh, we will see. Me so, too. I was I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I was sharing with uh, Andy a little while ago that that those are exactly my plans as well. You know, yeah, it's a twenty. <laughs> So, um, so again, thank you all for, for having me. Um, again, my name is Andy Haight. Um, I always put Andrew here on the slide because God knows I have to say it, the formal name. Right. Uh, no one calls me <laughs> Andrew, so Andy is fine. Mm -hmm. um, so in my half an hour or so today, I'm going to do two things. Um, first, I'm going to walk through a very quick overview of some of our key Census Bureau data programs. Uh, some of these are ones that you probably are, are already familiar with, uh, but I always am astounded by folks who are unaware of some of the data resources that are available to you and to your clients. Um, so I'll walk through those. Um, I want to reiterate uh, that the presentation materials, including the PowerPoint, will be made available to you all afterwards, so you don't have to frantically write down the URLs, et cetera, that I have here. Um, and that'll be about five or 10 minutes. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a demo of the latest version of Census Business Builder. So to kind of get us started, um, you would have to be living under a rock to, to know or not know uh, that we are currently in the progress of conducting the biggest thing that we do with the Census Bureau every 10 years, the decennial census. However, that is just one of more than 130 different programs we do at Census. Um, in addition to the decennial census, we do other demographic programs like the American Community Survey, and we do 58 business surveys, which is the side of the Census Bureau that I work in, um, that I particularly care about. Uh, the American Community Survey, if you are already, if you're not already familiar with this, please, please, please check out this URL. Um, the ACS is our biggest demographic survey, provides the most detailed, comprehensive, and most importantly, reliable demographic, socioeconomic, and housing data that you and your clients can use to better understand their customers. Um, I'm going to relay a couple of stories as we're walking through the demo today. Uh, one of them is that businesses today that were best able to deal with the COVID-19 shutdowns uh, and this whole pandemic were ones that had a very good understanding of who their customers are. And the ones that have not done quite so well, I would argue, never really completely understood their customers. For example, in the town that I live in, in Maryland, um, there are two really good restaurants. One of them is owned by a family that wholly, fully, completely believes that the only clients of theirs, the customers of theirs that are, and I'll use the word important, that's not fair, uh, <laughs> but important, right. are those who come and eat there in their restaurant. The, the restaurant right next to them has always, since the day they opened, offered drive-through um, carry-out service. And the reason why was their, the daughter of the family that owned that restaurant actually used to play for me uh, when I coached soccer ages ago. Um, and she went to Rutgers University, was an economics major, and was familiar with census data and actually worked with her parents to show how late people work around here in the DC area, how late they get home, and how many of these people are just so sick of work during the day that they don't wanna come home and cook something, but they also don't wanna go out to a restaurant. They wanna stop and pick up something and bring it back home with them. The restaurant that did not offer drive-through or carry-out service really had to play catch-up. Um, and I will tell you, I really like them, uh, but their food really suffered. Their service was mm -hmm. sort of horrible. And after three times of having our order fouled up, I finally said, I'm done. And we have not frequented them since then. And this has been almost three months now that we've been stuck home. So businesses that understand their customers that know the demographics and the economics of their communities that they serve are very um, are better uh, equipped to deal with shocks to their system. The ACS is a key data program that provides this kind of information. 
Um, this slide gives you an inf some information about the types of statistics that are available in the American Community Survey. You have basic demographic characteristics like age, race, and ethnicity. You have social, socioeconomic characteristics like the class of worker and commuting and employment status. Um, that statistic there, hours per week and weeks per year, those hours data was what I was just referring to. My, the girl who used to play for me, soccer, knew that the hours per week and the, and the working hours that people work around here finish around 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. So these people aren't getting home with the DC traffic mm. until 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. The last thing they want to do is go sit out in a restaurant. So they, it really helped advise uh, using this data, helped them better understand that in the town of Crofton, Maryland, there's a significant market of people that would really appreciate carryout service. Mm -hmm. um, this slide provides some information about the levels of geography that are published in our programs. And as you can see, in the American Community Survey, we not only publish data at things like states and counties, uh, places is our general term for cities, towns, villages, and boroughs, uh, but we even publish data in the ACS down to census tract and even block group level. When we get into the demo of Census Business Builder, you'll actually see the census tract level data and you'll see how powerful it can be in terms of better understanding the demographics, socioeconomics, and, and, and housing data for the communities that these businesses serve. Now, as great as those demographic surveys are, my heart is with our economic surveys. Uh, we do 58 different business surveys. They are best represented in the pyramid on the right. Um, and basically what I love about the pyramid is it not only uh, gives you some information about the hierarchy of our programs, but it gives you information about sort of the content. Our monthly surveys are incredibly timely, but they don't typically produce a lot of detailed data. Whereas our economic census that we do every five years is sort of the opposite of timely. Um, and, but it has the most comprehensive data that we have on businesses. At the top of that pyramid were the economic indicators. Uh, we do 17 economic indicators. These are the ones that you hear about on the evening news. On the right hand side is a screenshot from, our, from one of our data tools that looks at the monthly retail sales um, for the month of March. Um, and you can clearly see the shockingly gigantic decline um, that you'd see from where the trend was going up until February or March and what's happened since then. I haven't yet pulled the data for April or May, uh, but I think the line leveled out a little bit, but still continued down. Uh, I do wanna point out to you that this chart is looking at the seasonally adjusted data the chart is even worse if it had not been seasonally adjusted. Um, so these are great source of very timely data. So Andy, a quick yeah. question. What, what does seasonally adjusted mean? So when you think about sort of the normal business cycle, mm -hmm. some businesses are non-cyclical at all. Okay. Their sales from month to month to month to month do not change dramatically. Okay. Where other businesses are very seasonal. You know, if you think about the logging and sawmill industries in the Pacific Northwest, who is cutting down trees in January? If they are, they should have their head examined. <laughs> um, so what the seasonal adjustment does is it takes out those normal seasonal fluctuations in the data. It levels out. So what you're actually looking at is real growth as opposed to growth or decline that's a function of seasonality. Um, and so, as you can see, we were seeing a period of reasonably good retail growth. There was a dip in January of 2019, uh, but after then, you can see it sort of continued up um, mm -hmm. as a not, and then we hit COVID and ouch. Um, so this is a great source of data. Um, the two programs that I have highlighted on the left-hand side mm -hmm the only two monthly surveys that provide data below the national level. Mm -hmm. Building permits is incredibly valuable to yeah. entrepreneurs because yeah. it helps them understand future economic growth. Mm -hmm. When a developer comes in and is, is going to build some houses in a county in northern New Jersey, the first thing they do is they pull the permits yep. to build those houses. Mm -hmm. 
those houses then get built, they eventually get sold, and people move into them. Well, the start of that whole process was the permit, and being a business owner and knowing where those permits being mm -hmm. issued could help identify potential places to market my business. Correct, yep. The second program that I've highlighted here in red is our trade data. Hardly anybody knows that the Census Bureau publishes imports and exports data. The data are published down to state, region, and even court levels. So when you're working with entrepreneurs who are opening a manufacturing business, a small manufacturer, they may be completely unaware that they could be exporting their products, but looking at our trade data and looking at it by port and by commodity, they could then see, oh, wow, there's a lot of sandals. Actually, I'm telling you the truth here. I worked with a sandal manufacturer from Northern New Jersey um, who had a pretty good market for the sandals that she manufactured, but was unaware that we actually published detailed data on exports of sandals. Um, and when she saw how much sandals were leaving Port Authority in New York, New Jersey and New York Airport, um, she was just sort of astounded. So these are another resource that business owners can use to identify potential markets for their products. On the right-hand side, you can see one of my um, personal faves. I'm a beer fan. I'm a little <laughs> alarmed that our beer exports are as low as they are compared to the imports. Right. I was totally astounded uh, to see that we export more beer to Chile than any other country. I definitely <laughs> have to research that. I, I think I need to go there in person and figure out why are we exporting so much beer to Chile. <laughs> um, so research purposes. In addition to those monthly surveys, we have some annual programs, too, uh, that publish data every year on businesses. The two that I've highlighted here are the two that you all ought to know the most about. Mm -hmm. County Business Patterns produces data for what we call employer businesses. These are businesses with paid employees. These are the businesses that we typically think of when we're thinking of businesses in our communities. Non-employer statistics covers self-employed people. There are 25 million non-employer businesses in the United States, 8 million employer businesses. And in some industries, there are 10 times more non-employers than there are employers. So if you, as an SBDC counselor, are working with someone who's thinking about opening a daycare center, and they want to understand who is their competition, they would want to look at the county business patterns data on on daycare centers because that's going to be the kinder cares and the celebrities and these other sort of corporate uh, daycare centers but the non-employer statistics is where home-based daycare centers are classified and as i said in many areas of the country there are 10 times more self-employed people that are running a daycare center out of their house mm -hmm. than there are daycare centers regular employer daycare centers when we think about covid some of the daycare centers that were able to stay open were the non-employer ones. They were the ones who were not as, as affected as the, at least here in Maryland. Now, I don't know what the, what the policies are in New Jersey, um, but these two data products are critical in terms of understanding the total competition for a business, what, what are the other businesses like them, and for B2B businesses, these two mm -hmm. programs provide key information about their customers. Mm -hmm. So that's our annual programs. And then my last couple of slides here on, uh, on our data programs. We are right now in the midst of releasing data from the economic census. It is our most comprehensive program. We are in the midst of releasing what we call our local area data, which is where all of that really detailed, rich geographic data is going to be available for New Jersey. This is the release schedule. Uh, for when we are releasing the data. You can see I've put a circle around the geographic area statistics. And we have a nice little gas uh, geographic area series release visualization on our website. I have again provided the URL here where you can click on New Jersey and not only see what sectors of the economy have been released for New Jersey, but you can then click on a link from within that visualization, which will bring you right to the detailed data in the new data.census.gov platform. 
I suspect that many of you uh, on the call today are bemoaning the fact that we got rid of American Fact Finder. Um, <laughs> it's around 15 years. I will say that after 15 years, I finally had gotten used to it. And, and I do cry a little when it finally went south uh, back in March. Uh, but the new data.census.gov platform is really going to provide a lot more functionality than what AFF ever could provide. It is a little hard to use right now. That's why we created this visualization. Mm -hmm. It gives you shortcuts right to the data in American mm -hmm. Fact Finder. Yep. It's a really nice way of getting your clients to the data without having to them without them having to learn how to use American how to use the, the platform. Now, something I, I, I want to quickly address, you know, um, in, in place of American Fact Finder, uh, libraries, you know, just like the CUB is one of those uh, databases that, uh, or a resource uh, that most small businesses that I've encountered uh, kind of oversee a little bit because they don't really understand the value of it. Uh, a lot of data, a lot of libraries do subscribe to other databases that you can overlay on top of the information you can get from the CVB to create a more accurate picture of what your market is like or what kind of trajectory you should be on. Right. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, each library has their own budget, which means that they subscribe and pay to their own individual uh, databases. I know at a state level, uh, the New Jersey library system, uh, which all, all the libraries do subscribe to certain databases throughout the state, but then you find, you know, reach out to your local uh, library, which by the way, they, a lot of them are still open. They're just not open physically, but they're right. open virtually. So I can still access my, the databases from my library and depending on which library it is, you might even be able to check out a book or two, you know, digital, right. digital books, you know, right. uh, but yeah, I overlay, you know, business insights, which is one that I go to a lot, you know, in lieu of uh, American Fact Finder. Right. So just to let you know, uh, there is an entire market of businesses that have learned how to repackage Census Bureau data and charge you for it. Oh, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. We don't fight them. Our data are not copyrighted, so there's nothing for us to prevent them from doing that. We do ask them to cite us as a source. Mm -hmm. but everything that you're going to see from me today is all available to you for free. Mm -hmm. um, and that the point you were making about being able to combine data across different sources, that's actually a key principle of the Census Business Builder data tool, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. Yeah. So the last slides or so, um, many of you probably remember a survey that we used to conduct called the Survey of Business Owners. Um, SBO produced information on business ownership based upon the race, ethnicity, gender, and veteran status of the business owner. So if you want to know how many Hispanic owned restaurants are there in Hudson County, New Jersey, that data was available in SBO. What people loved about SBO was the fact that you had this really good, rich, detailed data. What they hated about it was it was only every five years. <laughs> uh, so we added a survey called the Annual Survey of Entrepreneurs that provided annual data, but it was nowhere near as detailed as the SBO was we just released on May 15th, the replacement for both of these surveys. So this new thing called the Annual Business Survey or ABS mm -hmm. produces similar data to what was in SBO, not quite as detailed, uh, but certainly more than what's in ASE. Mm -hmm. um, and it is promising to provide a lot more data in the future. So I would encourage you guys to check this out. Um, we will be adding the ABS data to Census Business Builder in our July release this year. So just, just to let you know that it's coming. There's still a value in, I think, uh, in historical data, you know, uh, even right. though it might not be, you know, uh, you know, what happened last week, but I can see the general movements, you know, and maybe uh, formulate patterns uh, as to wh where my consumer is going, you know, if I, you know, a great example, I guess would be, you know, Cadillac, you know, and how, uh, you know, the, most of their, uh, you know, core customers were aging, you know, and, you know, uh, they had to either uh, move geographically to, to where they are, uh, you know, in the, in the case of Cadillac, you know, it, it's, it's an international brand, but right. then change the product to, to cater to a new market that's emerging. You know, so although the, in the information might not be uh, the most uh, up to date, I can see the macro picture. And as kind of standing, you know, I guess, you know, you appreciate the macro and the microeconomics, you know, so I see the big picture first that I can get an idea of, all right, well, maybe shifting things slightly this direction with the general wave, you know, might be the way my business stays relevant. Exactly. Exactly. 
So the last thing I want to kind of walk through now is a demo. Um, this slide provides some information on some of the key data tools that we have at census.gov that produced that display demographic and business data. Um, the one I'm going to show you all today is Census Business Builder. So let me get out of here and let me tab over to my browser screen. So this is, you should be seeing now the census.gov website. Yep. To get to Census Business Builder, I could search for it. I, of course, could Google it. Everybody has to Google everything. Um, <laughs> I'm an old fart, so I want to go the old way. So I'm going to go to Explore Data, Data Tools and Apps, and then I'm going to choose Census Business Builder uh, from this menu. Fortunately, it begins with the letter C, so it's up toward the top. Mm -hmm. And so when you click on that link, you're going to come to the Census Business Builder homepage. And on this homepage are links to the two editions of Census Business Builder. Um, my internet at home is being a little cranky. Um, the version on the left-hand side, and right now I'm having some kind of problem with my browser where it won't show the icon. Um, the small business edition is the one that I'm going to demonstrate for you all today. It allows you to look at detailed data uh, for individual types of businesses. But the Regional Analyst Edition is one that I won't have a chance to demo, but I would encourage you all to check out. Uh, what it allows you to do is two things that are different from the Small Business Edition. First, the Regional Analyst Edition lets you build your own custom region. So let's say you're researching a construction business and the customers of that construction business are gonna be from a five county region in central New Jersey, let's say. You can build a custom region in the Regional Analyst Edition and the tool will automatically aggregate the demographic and business data to that five county region. And the region can be built of not only counties, but all the other geographies that are supported by CDB and by combinations of geographies. So let's say you wanted to choose Hudson County and then all of the cities that surround Hudson County that are kind of abut Hudson County you can build that custom region of county plus cities. The small business edition, like I said, is the one um, that is the one that we're going to look at. So let me go over here. Let's see here. My, my browser is just being cranky. <laughs> So when I go to the small business edition, uh, I come to what we call the splash page. On the splash page, I do two things. The first thing I can do is I choose the type of business that I want to research. The second thing I do is I choose the geography that I want to research. So let's just pretend I'm interested in opening a home health care business. Um, through all of this COVID stuff, um, health care has been very much in the news. Um, and home health care is a potential way for people to be, to have their needs taken care of while still being at home. So if I wanted to research opening a home health care business, I could choose health care, and then I could choose home health care from this menu. This high level menu that we just saw uh, provides access to the 54 most commonly opened small businesses. But we do have a search box so if you have an entrepreneur who's interested in opening a jewelry manufacturer, you could type in the word jewelry in this search box and it would give you a list of all the industries related to the word jewelry. Um, after I do that, I can then search for the area that I want to research. So I'm going to stick with my example here in Hudson County. And once I have chosen my industry and my geography, I can now go to the map. And what the application is now going to do is it's going to zoom in on Hudson County and it is going to produce a map uh, that shows some basic data for Hudson County. I can zoom the map in and out. I can pan the map, et cetera. So right now we're looking at total population um, of Hudson County, New Jersey. Um, and here, there we go. Total population um, is uh, the map variable. Census Business Builder, when it first went live in 2014, had four data variables in it. Uh, today it has 170, um, 174 variables in it. Wow. Um, when we go to total population, this is the list of all the data variables. So here are some more of those demographic related variables, uh, some age, race, and ethnicity data, 
we have some socioeconomic data like household income, educational attainment, disability status. Um, here's an important one for a home healthcare business. What is the percentage of people who have healthcare coverage? Mm -hmm. There's also some, ha some housing related data, number, number of owner versus renter occupied housing units. One thing that they've been concerned about, especially in the New York metro area is with COVID is how the spread of COVID has been different in owner occupied housing versus renter occupied housing. Renter occupied housing tends to be tighter together and that you see spikes of, of, of people catching COVID in areas where you have a high percentage of people who rent in apartment mm -hmm. buildings, for example. Uh, we also have some business data. Uh, this is going to give us information on those number of employer home health care businesses, their employment, payroll, and sales. Here are those self-employed people, these, the independent um, home health care aides. There's some key ratios, things like payroll per employee. If I was trying to open a home health care business and I was debating a couple of different counties in northern New Jersey, knowing on average how much they pay their employees might be good information. Um, and we even have some trade data that doesn't apply here. Uh, last year, we added some data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, quarterly census of employment and wages. So this is gonna give me quarterly data through second quarter 2019. The one variable that I think is the most important one of these two is total wages and average weekly wages. This one here is exactly why we added the BLS QCW data. Census doesn't publish data on wages. We have payroll, annual payroll, but seeing how much people are being paid by week could be very useful. We also have some quarterly workforce indicators data. Again, this is through 2019. The real value here is things like hires and separation, firm job gain, firm job loss, um, and even the average monthly earnings. Here's some of that building permits data that we were talking about before, the number of single family um, buildings, two family buildings, et cetera. Here is some data that we actually bought from Esri. Uh, Esri built this tool for us. Every year they compile data on consumer spending. Um, they will gladly sell you the entire data set for $10,000. Mm -hmm. I think many of you have $10,000 burning a hole in your pocket. So we bought a piece of it from them and we put it in the tool. So if I was opening a restaurant and I wanted to research how much do people spend on dining out, that number is here. But let's say I was debating whether or not my restaurant should serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or just dinner, or just lunch and dinner. I might be interested in looking at the breakout here of how much do people spend on breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Here it is right wow. here. These data are available down to the census track level. And I think when you look at the spending patterns in New Jersey, you will see some really fascinating things. People who buy breakfast on the way going into New York and then come home and have, so they have big breakfast expenditures kind of where they live because they're stopping on the way to the train station or the subway or, or to the ferry to pick up you know, their breakfast. You got great data uh, here as well. But Andy, I have a quick question. So uh, sure. how many industries uh, does the consumer spending look at? So the spending data is, is not related directly to the industry we selected. Okay. Uh, we went through the about 2,000 data variables that Esri publishes and pulled 90 of them okay. out to put in this tool. As you guys use this, if there are spending information that you want that you don't see in here, mm -hmm. please, please, please email me. You'll see my email address in just a moment. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, the last feature that I want to mention here is my variables. Um, this feature almost, uh, I'll say this somewhat jokingly, almost got me fired um, <laughs> because I recognize, and I think a lot of my colleagues did, that users of our data and our tools want to combine our data with other data sources, and they don't care that those other sources may come from a third party or from another federal agency or maybe from a state government agency. They just want to be able to mash their data up with ours. That's what my variables does. It allows them to go in and import, if you will, upload their data into this tool and they can then combine it. I'm gonna give you a real life story. It happens to be for the city of Philadelphia. 
Um, but I was working with a restaurateur in Philadelphia who had a database, a spreadsheet of customers' data for all the customers of her restaurant. And she had that data geocoded to every zip code around the city of Philadelphia. So she knew how much people were spending that lived in each zip codes that are around where her restaurant was. And what she wanted to do was she wanted to overlay her data for where her customers were coming from with the data for the overall market to find out, does she have any gaps? Were there any places where she wasn't getting any penetration? Her marketing wasn't reaching certain areas of Philadelphia and using this tool, she was able to immediately see, you know, a dozen zip codes around Philly where her marketing for some reason just wasn't reaching there. So it's a, it's a really nice, it's a nice feature. Yeah. Now, so far, we've been looking at data um, <clears throat> at the county level. As you just know, might have noticed, the tool does provide data at the city level. So when I do this, we're now going to be looking at city level data. So this is cities um, in northern New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I can zoom in some, zoom in on Jersey City here. So there's the, here's the, well, my internet's really cranky today. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, while, while the internet's working, uh, I guess I'll, I'll share a quick little story. You know, a lot of the loans that we've put together through our office, you know, um, uh, well, assisted uh, other businesses in structuring their loans. The ones that have had the strongest, um, uh, I guess, reception at the, at the underwriters level are the ones that we include data from these reports, you know, because it's very detailed. It, it shows the underwriter that you do understand your market and that you, you know where you're going because it, it gives a very clear picture that anybody can see clearly uh, this is where my customer is and this is how I'm getting to my customer. And there's very little guesswork. Right. Yep. So to that point, um, one thing I was going to mention, I'll, I'll mention it now, this map URL can be bookmarked and mm -hmm. I can then put that bookmark in a document that I'm working on. When a user clicks on it, it'll bring them right back to this map. And then same thing, if I now go in and create a report, for Jersey City. This report can also be bookmarked and we've got a lot of entrepreneurs that are using these reports mm -hmm. and including the data from this report in their loan application, yep. in their business plan, et cetera. Um, because again, it just makes it so easy to get to the data. Yeah. Uh, the reports are all fully fully manipulable. Uh, so mm -hmm. right now we're looking at percent under five. If I were to look at elderly, here's percent 65 and over. Um, here's my business data down here, um, et cetera. So you've got all of these different resources that are available. Again, in the amount of time that I have today, I'm not gonna get a chance to really demo some of the other power features. There's the ability to download the map. You can bring in your own reference layers, et cetera. Uh, yeah. But this is basically the tool that we built to make it easier for SBDC counselors to guide their clients to the key data that they need to help them make decisions. Um, in fact, just to let you know, this tool actually debuted at the ASPDC annual conference in Grapevine, Texas in 2015. Oh, I didn't know that. So, um, we built this specifically for SPDCs. Really? So, wow. yep. Wow, so, okay. Feeling very special now. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. So <laughs> that's... You, yeah, so that's my presentation. Um, as I said, um, if you guys, guys have any questions, um, you, please feel free to contact me. Uh, this is my email address and phone number. Uh, my colleagues thought that I was insane for giving you all my census cell phone. Uh, if you have <laughs> my office phone, that ain't going to help. Um, I haven't been in my office for 12 weeks or so. Um, and then the last little thing I'll mention, and I'm not going to demo it at all, um, about four weeks ago, three weeks ago, we released something called the COVID-19 Hub, which is a platform that takes some of those selected data that we had in CBB, as well as some other data, and presents it um, to users so that they can use, use it to make decisions about their business um, and recovering from COVID-19. Um, there's a number of components of this. You can see I've actually zoomed in on, on Hudson County, um, but the, you have a dashboard approach over here, you have maps, and you have all the data is fully downloadable. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you guys to check it out. So that's all I had. Um, thank you guys for the time to let me uh, 
chat about Census Business Builder. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so so I have some private questions that went to me directly. Um, one of them is, does the census provide a customer list? So short answer, no. Um, slightly longer answer. With only one or two exceptions, all of the data that we publish at the Census Bureau is subject to disclosure regulations. Title 13 of the US Code says that we are not allowed to publish data that would identify individual people or individual businesses. So we don't publish any name and address information for individual businesses. What I always tell users to do is use our summary level data to sort of focus your research. Okay. I'm trying to find zip codes in northern New Jersey that have more than five restaurants because I'm opening a restaurant wholesale business and I want to be able to, to sell to those customers. Um, use our data to, to sort of narrow your research and then go to one of the third party data providers like Dundee Bradstreet or one of the other ones that are willing to, to give you those names and addresses. Mm -hmm. And then you're only now pulling names and addresses for, for businesses that you sort of have already pre-qualified. You, you already know that's the area that I want to start with. Mm -hmm. um, one note or tip I will tell you, um, we do not let, let a business self-classify. We don't let them choose their own NAICS code. We choose it for them. Whereas most other third-party data providers let the business choose their own industry code. Mm. Some industries, that is not a problem at all. If you are a grocery store, you're, you know you're not a gas station. Mm -hmm. this, this, is not, this is not rocket science. But other types of businesses, the self-classification thing really is problematic. And yeah. so what I always tell people is read the fine print. When you're using these other data sources, mm -hmm. understand their sample sizes, understand their response rates, understand what types of businesses are and are not included. Um, understand how they review the data that has been reported to them. So the example I was giving before about restaurants, if I was running a restaurant that had a bar in the restaurant, and in most years, my food sales were greater than my bar sales, I would be classified by the Census Bureau as a restaurant. But if I happen to have a really good bar year, <laughs> you know, the NCAA tournament is in my city, the, the everybody comes to my bar, <coughs> they, they, they buy all my booze, uh, I have a really good bar year, but the restaurant not so much. I would actually train, change classification from a restaurant to a bar at the Census Bureau, whereas mm. to that restaurant owner, they may still think of themselves as a restaurant. So to Dun & Bradstreet, they may still be considered a restaurant. So just sort of understand the, the, those data when you do that merge so that you know what you're, what you're getting. I, I'm not saying do not use those other data sources. I use third-party data all the time. Just use it intelligently. So then Andy, I have, uh, I have a follow-up question to that. Sure. Because a lot of businesses do have multiple NICS codes and SIC codes, you know, and maybe even their own state codes, you know. Um, uh, there's one that's usually the primary, you know. Uh, so does census uh, dismiss anything other than primary? Is, is that, if I, did I understand you correctly? So our data are primarily published based upon the primary NAICS code, okay. but we do provide what we call product lines data that okay. then talk about the other things that they do. So in, when I'm running a restaurant and I'm classified as a restaurant, my bar sales are measured in our product lines data, even though that bar is sort of captive inside the, the, the restaurant. So yes, we, we sort of publish it both ways, but the primary dimension is based on the primary. It's, it's very important. And, and like you, you know, I advise all of uh, business owners that I work with to uh, overlay all the different, you know, third party providers and, right. uh, you know, independent party providers. And some of them do to the person who asks you a question, the question regarding a customer list, they will give you the, uh, the name of the executive, the phone number and email if it's audited, depending on how much you're willing to pay. Uh, and in some cases, you know, there are a few databases that will provide some of that information for free but the data won't be as detailed as it is with CBB. So I start off with CBB as my core, and then I just overlay it with some of the other ones. And anybody has any questions, reach out to us. I'll let you know what those databases are and how to use them for free. Yep, absolutely. Right. right. So I have here another question. Um, sure. 
How often is the data updated? So right now in Census Business Builder, we have annual data and we have quarterly data. So in the, for the annual data, obviously we are updating it as soon as that annual data are available. Uh, most of our data come out either in June or July or in December. For example, the American Community Survey is updated every December, the first week in December. The quarterly data, right now we are releasing CDB in two releases a year, which means that the quarterly data then gets held. Like you'll have recent data available that hasn't yet made it into CDB. We're actually addressing that finally this year. Mm -hmm. So we're moving to four releases. So there'll be a, Ju a July release, there'll be an October release, and there'll then be the December release. So you won't have that lag. I am hoping before I retire that we switch CBB to a monthly update um, because we could then start incorporating some of that monthly building permits data, the monthly trade data, things like that. But yeah, it's we update it as soon as we have the data available. Awesome. Great, great. Um, so it looks like we have just one minute left. Um, if you can uh, close out your your uh, shared screen, uh, Andy, and then sure. I'll pull up the rest of uh, you pull that up, uh, here. Uh, while you pull that up, Christian, I'm going to answer one of the other questions. You know, is can we search by uh, NICS codes or SIC codes? Um, I know that on third party providers, you can um, use one or two or five different NICS codes if, if you guys want to, uh, to get a clear list of w where either your competition is or other businesses that, are can, that can be a vertical to you, that can work alongside you, you know, that can uh, you know, uh, either provide resources or referrals to you guys. Uh, Andy, do you want to address about uh, doing searches by NICS codes on CBB? Yeah, so um, CBB, of course, has that NICS search in there as well. And there's a NICS search in a number of other data tools as well. Um, we do have comparability tables that relate the old SIC system to the NAICS classification systems, but to be quite honest, we, I'm going to try to be nice here, <laughs> SIC died in 1997. Let it die. <laughs> there are still data providers that publish data on an SIC basis. Yeah. I, I am quite frankly alarmed that they are still doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are industries that existed in SIC that don't exist today, mm -hmm. like paging. Wow. Do any of you <laughs> carry a pager? <laughs> Have my sympathy. Um, you need to work for a different place. Yep. Um, so um, there's that, and there's also industries that did not exist under SIC. Mm -hmm. um, so like we just added a brand new NAICS code last census for solar geothermal biomass um, and wow. uh, electric power generation and wind electric power generation. We didn't have wind power in 1997. So we don't have any, yeah. any SIC-based searching on census.gov other than those comparability tables that relate yeah. the SIC yeah. codes. But, yeah. but for, when we register a company, uh, well, when anybody registers a company, you know, they ask you for your codes. You know, and I have a tough time sometimes. I'll find it on the, on the NICS side, but I won't find that code on the SIC side. That's but right. the registration won't let you finish uh, you know, creating the articles of incorporation or formation, whatever you, know, you choose unless you put all the different codes in. So yeah. it's, it's still a broken system, yeah. Yeah, it's, that's very broken. Because like I said, there, yeah. there are industries that there, were, there was no place for that code yeah. under yeah. SIC. Yep. There was no internet <laughs> under SIC. <laughs> yep. So where do you put ISPs yep. and you know, email providers? Yep. And yep. Yep. Like that? I, I, I have that problem all the time. So it's always a best guess. You know, or, or I one of the other trick I do is I look at my competition, you know, and then I look up their codes and then I use that as a guideline. But, you know, we'll talk about that another time because we, we don't have that much time left. All right. So we have two, awesome. uh, two quick sections. You know, it's only you know 30 seconds each. But, uh, you know, every week we like to give you guys a tip or a trick, uh, something that can help you grow your business, especially in this time where, you know, you have to be very lean with your business model, you know, uh, get the most return for your time and get the most return for your dollar. Uh, so understanding where my business is and how to grow my business. Uh, look at your competition online, look at their social media presence and see who they're following. I'm sorry, who's following them. And, and chances are, if this is a close competitor to you and they're, and they're following your competition, they might want to follow you too, or, or at the bare minimum buy from you, you know, 
So, and that, that's a good, easy way that has cost very little money. Go on to their Instagram, your competition, go on to the, uh, you know, Snapchat or TikTok or, you know, Facebook of your competition and see who's following and then engage with them in a way that's very uh, natural and genuine. You know, don't sell them, don't spam them with a 20% off coupon. If you come by, you know, buy from me. But, you know, uh, genuine compliments, you know, to a uh, recent post uh, that relates to your product. Yeah, I definitely tell all my clients, um, it's like a relationship. You're not asking the person uh, to get married on the first time you meet them, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have to sort of go on a date first, then you go on the second date, the third date, and, and that's sort of how you have to think of when you um, try to sell a, a client or a customer. Um, that's your, your initial outreach is the first date um, your follow-up is the second date, um, and you might not get married until the first or second year <laughs> of sending emails and social media content and all this, right? So it's it's forever evolving. Um, and to complement the CBB yeah. data uh, or or um, or the census data, you can be able to pull um, by following the or l looking at the customers that follow your competition. You can understand their buying behavior. What are, who are they following? You know, you can understand geography. Where are they? You know, and then you can start to modify your product. Your company gets evolved based on your uh, customer. And my competitors' customers can also be my customer. Right, right. And, and I'm sorry, I need to bring this question up because I totally, I just remembered. Um, Andy, can you upload an email list to the tool and can it give you certain um data points okay so i'm going to restart so we have geocoding software at the census bureau that would allow you to upload addresses and it would mm -hmm. spit back out the geocodes that are related to those addresses so yes we we have those kind of services available and then once you have run that then you can then take that list of geographies that now are related to those addresses that you just entered and then tie those over into our data tools to find the data for those geographies. So yes, you could, yeah, yeah. you could do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's obviously not done on email addresses. It's just regular street addresses. Um, right. And, and things like PO boxes give us fits. We don't, we typically don't geocode to PO box, mm -hmm. um, things like that. But yes, we, we have those resources available. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's super important for, for businesses because um, being that we're now sort of in an online, uh, uh, the majority of us have to be online and um, your your customer base, you, you have to have, and I tell this to small businesses all the time, an email list is a business asset. Yep. And yep. Um, using that asset to get data and further understand your customer is is, you know, is a golden nugget, right? right? Your customer information is actually protected under the um, um, U.S. Patent and Trade Office. So it's actually, you know, intellectual property. So it's right. very much an asset. Right. Yep. 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 Right. Awesome. Last okay. uh, slide. All right. So here it says uh, by Sam Walton. Um, he is the, the Walmart. Walmart. <laughs> he, he, he is, is Walmart. Walmart, yeah. Walmart right. Sam's Club. You know, yep. <laughs> Um, so he says, there's only one boss, mm -hmm. the customer, and they can fire everybody in the company from the chairman on down simply by spending their money somewhere else. And I mean, how, I think that that's super true for any industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is why you want to be able to use certain databases and get that data, you know, to understand what's the consumer buying behavior. Where is my consumer moving to? If my average consumer is in between the ages, I'm going to make up a number and say 25 and 45. Well, I can look at the demographic data in my community and see is a trend going up or down? Are people moving into or out of my town if I'm catering to that community and then massage my business accordingly? You know, so that's why I need to know the, uh, the information, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, if anybody has ever been to any of the classes that I, that I hold, you know, I, I love this little corny phrase that I, you know, I came up with, which is, uh, you can't find what you cannot define. So I have to define my customer, clearly define the customer, and then I can start to find the customer in different places. Right, right. right. And uh, by the way, guys, uh, this Wednesday, we're having, uh, we're bringing back our starting a business and business planning workshop. Um, and that'll take you from A to Z of how to, um, you know, register a business, 
um, write down your plan, you know, put goals on there, write out your marketing strategy. Um, well, so it's, it's, it's high level. Yeah. It's going to be pretty high level. So it's not, right. we're not you know, we only have a limited amount of time. So we can't go into too much detail with any one aspect. You know, that's when you have that one-on-one -on -one session. But uh, we do introduce you all to all the basic areas on how to get certain, you know, business registered and uh, like Christian was saying, and the basic differences between an LLC and a, maybe an LLP or, uh, I don't know, a S Corp or whatnot. Right, right. So if you guys need that, I'm going to drop it into the chat right now where you could find it. Um, there you go. And um, that's it for Mindshare Monday. So I want to thank uh, Andy for, you know, for giving us the time and um, super in-depth, you know, information on how we can use these tools for businesses. I think it was super helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. And a, lo a lot of, uh, thank you, Andy, you know, on the, on the comment section. So thank everybody thought it was super me. Yeah, it was great. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you, Andy, again, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Have a great, have a great day. Adios, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, see everyone.